So, I'm relatively new to this world, as Betty pointed out. I am in my 14th year as a professional ballet dancer. And as she mentioned, I took on the role as executive director of a dance company about 10 years ago. For me, that process of learning how to be a fundraiser, manager of people, booking agents, all of the above, was completely out of necessity. It just had to happen. But as I was thrown in, and I enjoyed learning in, in, in the process, I had to think a lot about what I knew as an artist and the process of being a dancer and what does that mean to take the form that you've inherited, the technique, the training, and then, and then make it come alive. That's what a lot of artists have to do. At any point, I think, in their career, they go deep with their training, right? So if you're going to be trained to be a cellist, you spend a lot of time just perfecting the form. But at some point, for you to really be an artist and not just a technician, it requires an equal balance of form and feeling, for lack of a better word. I worked for a man named Alonzo King for a long time in San Francisco. And Alonzo is a guru and sort of a mentor and this brilliant thinker. And he talked a lot about the creative process. As Betty mentioned, prior to joining Alonzo King, I danced with American Ballet Theater, which I would say is really all about the form. It's a classical ballet company. You know, it's one of the, considered one of the greatest in the world. It's Swan Lake, it's Giselle, with a little bit of new work tossed in for flavor. But it's really all about perfecting the form. If you look at videos of Baryshnikov and Makarova and Gelsey Kirkland from the you know, 70s, 80s, it's astounding how quickly the form of ballet has progressed. So today, dancers can do things that Baryshnikov is considered a game changer, you know, evolve the form greatly. There's people now that can do much more than he could. Because the, the uh, standards and the expectations continue to grow at such a level. But what you look back and see, what I see from the 70s and 80s is, they brought something different. There was an artistry and a creativity that in my discipline, in my domain of ballet, I find is a little bit lacking now. So we've taken the form and, and excelled and built upon it to such degrees but do we have that balance? When I worked with Alonzo King in San Francisco, he was the first choreographer that I worked with that talked exclusively about what is this creative process? How are you taking all the information that I'm giving you? And as a choreographer, he would assign the steps, right? He would say, here's everything you have to do. Here's the musicality, here's the step, here's the level change, here's what I want you to create, but now you have to make it come alive. You, how do you bring yourself to it? How do you make it new? How do you constantly challenge what it is and not throw out your inheritance, what I've given you, but, but make it of this moment right now? How do you live in the present? So some of this is also, he, he would be very spiritual about it, but some of it was also just a process, a practice. How do you continue to develop your own creative process? Because it's not something... It's not, a, it's not another technique or form you can learn and just emulate. It's something that you have to build for yourself. He taught me a lot about how to make yourself vulnerable every day. And that's, I think for a lot of people, uh, anathema to success, making yourself vulnerable. How do you start over every day? So you maybe had this brilliant performance the night before where you were conquering all of, the, all of your goals for the night. You were... You were you know, engaging with the audience, it was this you know, moment in time that you remember forever, and then the next day you walk back in, and when the first thing you do as a ballet dancer is you hold on to the bar, and you stand in first position, and you do a plie. You just do the simplest movement, right? And that progresses into tendus and degages, and you build your body back up from the beginning. And for me, that's a metaphor for the same process that I had to do creatively. You have to let go. So we define ourselves by our successes. We define ourselves by how we've evolved and the accommodations or the accreditations and you know, all the things people have said about you and, and your body of work and what you've built up. There's something interesting about being a dancer. It's this incredibly ephemeral art form. It goes away. It was alive and then it was done. And so as you walk in the next day, how do you start over? How do you let go of everything that came before? Alonzo used to call it the art of falling getting used to that sensation of letting go, because the creative process 
as I see it and have experienced it, is more about letting go than addition. Letting go more than adding. But you build up this form. You build up your knowledge and your experience to the point where <coughs> it is your guide. And it's always there if you learn to trust it. But you have to have it in equal balance to who are you and how are you making it come alive. So as a dancer who was thrust into being an executive director at age 22, I had to really think about, okay, I have to raise $1.5 million this year. So we're going to create a plan. You know, we expect X amount is going to come from individuals. We know who this, most of those individuals are. We're going to get this amount probably from the National Endowment for the Arts. We're probably going to get this amount from a special event. You, know, you break it down. You, you figure out your budget. That's, that, and, you, and you build a strategy. That's, for the most part, the, the form. And you, you know, have your budget approved by your board of directors in the prior fiscal year, and then the year starts. And at 22, or probably by the time I was 26, I had 20 plus employees. We had to make payroll. We had to make sure that everything happened as it should, and that people were being treated with respect, and that we were supporting the vision of Trey McIntyre. But also, it was my job to say, how do we make this vision come alive? How do we market it? How do we fund it? How do we produce it? And I took that, I had a lot of fantastic mentors and people that helped me along the way, but I took the information and the form and I had to, it was very, it was incredibly scary. I can't tell you the number of mornings I woke up and thought, I have no idea how to do this. <laughs> and I had to really think about, well, what do I know? And it's that same process for me of being a dancer, that creative process that I discovered was, you know the steps, you know what's expected of you, you know what it feels like to go out on stage and, and give an excellent performance, you know what it goes, feels like to go on stage and completely bomb. And falling is not the worst thing that can happen on stage, it's actually a pretty cathartic thing. Because <laughs> if, if you fall, all you can do is get back up. If you fall, I mean, you know, except for like breaking something or ripping your Achilles, it's how you get back up. It's how you then make sense of what happens next that is the most illuminating and captivating thing that you can do on stage. And I thought a lot about that in terms of fundraising. It's scary to go sit with someone and ask them for money, right? It's scary to put yourself on the line and support something so fully and believe in it that you then ask for their, their belief, to share that belief with you. But I thought, but that's no different than me going on stage and... and as articulately and with, with as much eloquence and elegance as possible, bringing to life this choreography or this vision. So what does it mean to now go sit with someone? I want to invite them to be a part of this world that we're creating, to share this moment in time, to understand that we're doing this collectively. It's not a transaction of you support me and I get to do what I want, but how are we going to build this together? So I began making a lot of creative correlations. And that led me to really understand that even though my training was as a dancer, the creative process that I had begun to learn and hone over my career was maybe a transferable skill. Maybe it's just a translation issue. Maybe we just need to better understand, you, know, you have to understand the differences of the domains. Every form is different. The, the rules are different, you know, if you're in accounting and budget, that's, that, that's different than, um, you know, functioning and, and fine art of the humanities, but what are the, what are the crossovers? So, we, I'll, I'll go back in time a little bit to the beginnings of Trey McIntyre projects. I had been dancing with American Ballet Theater, as mentioned. It was all about form. I got the job right out of high school, which is pretty typical for a ballet dancer. We, at age 18, I moved to New York and started my career, and arguably, you know, one of the top five ballet companies in the world. Everybody thought I'd made it, right? All my friends felt, oh, you're an ABT, you must be one of the best, or you're an American Ballet Theater, um, you know, now you just need to keep following that same line of progression. You need to get promoted, and then promoted, and then promoted, and then promoted, and then you get to start doing these roles, and then people will know who you are, and you're going to make a lot of money, and you're going to travel the world, and all that started to happen. I started in the second company, 
which is the Young Bucks, and then I quickly was promoted to apprentice, and then I made it to corps de ballet, and I was on my way to being promoted again, when I realized in the middle of this tour to Athens, Greece, we're performing at the Herodotus Atticus, which is you know, this ancient Greek uh, amphitheater, not dissimilar to the, some of the classrooms they have at Booth, where everybody's elevated looking down, and you're sort of down there. <coughs> you know, instead of in modern-day theaters, you're elevated and everyone's looking up at you. But there's something empowering about that feeling and the energy of a room where everybody's, it's all focused right there. And it sits at the foot of the Acropolis. And we would, uh, you couldn't take the stage until about 11, 11.30 at night because this is just an old stone amphitheater. And in order to dance, we dancers lay a surface called marley, which is essentially rubber. And if you lay it while the stones are still hot, it'll melt the rubber. So we wouldn't take the stage until about 11.30 at night, every night, which meant we went to the beach. <laughs> and we would hang out, and we would party, and we were 20-year-olds. And I'm in the middle of this unbelievable tour, which to this day, that was, what, 10, 12 years ago, everyone in American Ballet Theater still says that was the best tour of their life. <laughs> I was in the middle of this fantastic tour, and then we flew from there to Orange County, California, where we were filming uh, Frederick Astin's The Dream for PBS. So I was also, at 21, 22, being given lots, lots of money. Like, I got my SAG membership, I still get royalty checks to this day for like 13 cents for <laughs> that production. <laughs> I'm in the middle of this, and the upcoming season with American Ballet Theater was going to be one where I knew I would be highly valued. We were doing the works of William Forsyth and Nacho Duazzo and Yuri Killian, and I knew that I would have a lot of acclaim and time and energy, but I really, I was really, I realized I'm unhappy because all the rules of this domain are about increasing the form, and there was nothing that for me was creative. My favorite moments were getting to work with choreographers and create and, and, and lend my voice and feel like I was evolving not just my own personal you know, body and self, but evolving the domain. How are we changing it? How are we shaping it? I wanted to be a creative. I wanted to be an artist. And I would say a lot of dancers in American Ballet Theater, they're brilliant, but not all of them are artists. They're athletes or technicians. And I think that applies to a lot of people. Most surgeons aren't creative but there are some who are. Not all attorneys are creative, but every now and then there are a few that as uh, the no noted psychologist Mihai Csikszentmihalyi would say, or he defines a creative person as someone who changes the domain. So there are attorney attorneys who argue in front of the Supreme Court and change case law. One of those such men is a founding board member of Trey McIntyre Project. He's based in Philadelphia and I was talking with him. He's also a graduate of the law school here. And he and I are going to be teaching a course together in the fall at the law school on creativity. And I was meeting with the dean of the law school a couple times, uh, Dean Schill. And he was like, what are you going to talk about? And what's the format? What's the syllabus? I said, we're probably not going to have much of a, a format. I mean, as you can see right now, I like to just talk and see if anything good comes up. <laughs> and again, for me, that's a little bit of my creative process get in, understand what's happening, what needs to be said, instead of just coming and delivering a pretty predetermined package. So Mark Aronchik, this attorney in Philadelphia who graduated from the law school, and I said, well, Mark, what, what makes you creative? What makes you feel like you've exercised that creative process? And he said, it's, I know law. I know case law. I know how to make the argument. I know how to draft the document. I know how to state the, you know, everything that needs to be stated. But for me, it's when I get to go and evolve the form, change case law, see things in a new way, argue something that hasn't previously been argued. That's my pursuit now. And if again, me on a, on a thought process of, again, what is, the, what is this creative process, right? Everybody kind of throws around the word, word creativity, and it's a pretty large bucket. What is it to be creative? What is it to be innovative? And we're all sick of saying those words. I'm sick of saying those words because it's too big a bucket. To be creative is, is a thousand things. There's creative problem solving where you're given what the end result needs to be and then you just sort of figure out how to make it go to that point. Or, you know, there's a problem and you have to creatively solve it, meaning you can't just follow the, 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 white, the white pages of the, the book that's already been given to you that says here's how you do this. But what is cre creativity in terms of 
channeling the unknown? What is a personal creative process? What is it when an attorney is creative or when a surgeon is creative? Do artists own the domain? Are they the most creative ones in the world? You know, is a chef or a fashion designer just as creative? And what is their creative process separate from an artist? So Mark and I were talking about what it is to evolve a form, what it is to understand, as Alonzo King would say, the unknown. So for me, the creative process is always having one foot in the known, the form, the technique, everything that you've been taught and trained and spent your life working on, but then constantly challenging yourself to step into the unknown. And you're always on that precarious place. It's awkward. You're putting yourself in a place of vulnerability. You're putting yourself in a place of great ambiguity. Jerry McIntyre Project has been a huge success. I was at the helm for nine years. We achieved great things. We, in some ways, reinvented what we thought a dance company could be or should be. We based it in Boise, Idaho, and all of our friends in the dance world said, you're stupid. <laughs> it just flat out stupid. <laughs> but we said, there's, there's something to this. We, we knew we'd be a national company, so the company <coughs> tours to 30 to 40 cities a year. They were just at the Harris Theater la uh, two weeks ago. They're now in we're in Miami, and next they're going to Minneapolis on Monday. The board of directors is national, so they come from 10 different states. And at one point, we had patrons from 40 states. So people questioned, why are you going to Boise, Idaho? We truly, in hindsight, didn't know. We just had a feeling, an intuition. We were given the option of basing the company in San Francisco, or Seattle, or Houston, or Memphis, or Washington, D.C., or Portland. We were in a really excellent position. Trey's acclaim as a choreographer was at our all-time high. We had had the company as a f for four years as a sort of a summer pickup group. Dancers, like academics, usually have the summer off, typically. And so for four years, we would convene Trey's favorite group of dancers from around the world at a place called White Oak Plantation down in North Florida. Has anyone heard of White Oak Plantation? It's this unbelievable place. He's nodding. Uh, the billionaire Howard Gilman, it was his family estate, and his passions were ballet and endangered species. So when you're driving onto the 7,000 acre property that straddles both Florida and Georgia along the, the Atlantic Ocean, you're driving in and you see some horse stables and you think, oh, horses, you may go go horseback riding later. And then you get closer and you're like, oh, those are zebra. And then you're getting a little closer and you think, oh, and those are giraffe. And then you see the tigers and the lions and the cheetahs and the okapi and the herds of antelope. And you realize you're in the modern day Jurassic Park. And nestled in the middle of this fantastic realm is the Baryshnikov Dance Studio. Because Howard Gilman and Mikhail Baryshnikov were good friends. And he created a dance project called White Oak Dance Project that was based there. So for for the first six or seven years of Trey McIntyre Project, that was our retreat. We would go there for a month in the summer. I collectively have now spent over a year of my life at this beautiful place, which now no longer really exists in the same format because it's been sold and it's being turned into a luxury resort and will never be the same. But we had these four years of, of building what we wanted Trey McIntyre Project to be. Meaning, figuring out what is not just the mission statement and, and the business plan and what are we going to do, but well, why are we doing this? And I think why is a really important question. It's a question I ask myself a lot. It's a question I was asking myself on the way here. Like, so why am I giving this talk today? Because <laughs> as I mentioned, the creative process is very uncomfortable. I am in a very uncomfortable place these days. I'm working in a business school and at a university where I speak a very different language than most of the people I'm interacting with on a daily basis, so I'll get back to that later, but the why of it. Why are we forming a dance company? We spent four years building up this, this sense of vision. Trey's an excellent choreographer. He should have his own company, right? Choreographers, freelance choreographers, have to go, usually what they do is they go into a, a dance company somewhere in the world that hires them, and they usually have four to five weeks to come and make a work of art on a group of dancers that they've never met. That's pretty much like going up to you know, a world-class painter and saying, you know, pull back the curtain and saying, your medium will be oils this time, or acrylics this time, or now you're going to do a sculpture. You have no idea what your medium is going to be. You don't know these people. You can assume you all speak a common language because you have the same form, right? Everyone's been trained in ballet. That's not really 
that's kind of secondary. It almost doesn't matter when you're trying to create a work of art. You have no idea what the behaviors, the beliefs, you know, the, the respect and, and of, of that community will be. You don't know how those dancers will participate or behave. So in wanting to launch a company, Trey said, I really need to create a culture that understands what I'm creating. And that's not just the dancers. That's the funders and the staff and the board and, and everyone collectively coming together. So we spent four years building up this idea of, of culture and what we, we wanted it to be. We had worked in, I'd worked in seven different dance companies, traders who now worked in over 80 around the world. So we'd seen the cultures of most dance companies and we knew what worked and what didn't work. And we said, we, you know, we don't want that, we do want this. Dancers are incredibly talented, hardworking, intuitive, brilliant artists, they can be. They can also be talented house pets that sort of lay around until they are asked to do something and they get up and do it, physically brilliant, but not always as articulate or artistically you know, luminous as you want them to be. Some dancers are very transactional. Again, they've mastered the form. They know that they can do this really well, and it looks right, and it functions correctly, and that's enough. Again, not that dissimilar from many of the people that you probably work with or meet in life. Tell me what to do, I'll perfect it, and I'll do it as exactly as you want it. But what is it to then really change what it is? I mentioned Brishnikov earlier. He came along and did all everything right, everything the way it was supposed to be done, but then he did it in a way that we'd never thought of, right? He did it in a way that was just mind-blowing. And I think in any domain around the world, across any field or spectrum, you, you know those people. And then a lot of people say, well, they were just, you know, more creative, or they were lucky, or, you know, if you read a lot of books on creativity and on brilliant people, which I've been doing lately because I'm in an academic institution, so I'm going to read a lot. <laughs> <laughs> they all talk about, I just failed a lot. I just kept trying. I just kept putting myself in that place of, of you know, discomfort until I started to find that some path or some thread. And then it still didn't work, and I just kept going. Brishnikov came along at a time when ballet was, was sort of in the, the, in the national and international zeitgeist, right? The Cold War was happening. Russia and the West weren't really communicating, except when the Bolshoi Ballet came to town. And they would have all these secret meetings. And, and ballet became one of the greatest ambassadors and emissaries that Russia or the USSR was putting out into the world. And then at the height of that period, Brishnikov defects. Right? And, and some of you were alive during that time. It was big news. It's probably the only time that ballet has crossed over into pop culture and stayed in pop culture for an extended period of time. Brishnikov then starred in movies with Anne Bancroft and Shirley MacLaine and Gregory Hines and some, most of us now know him as also starring in Sex and the City as Carrie Bradshaw's final lover in the final season, which is a little sad to me because most youngins these days only know him from that and not from <laughs> groundbreaking feats as a international <coughs> ballet star. But Brishnikov came along and changed the form. But more than changed the form, he elevated the feeling of what it, what it was to be a dancer. He captured people's imaginations. He made you believe in something that yet hadn't been there. He came with a creative process, that he was challenging everything that had come before, but not discarding it. He took his inheritance, his, the tradition and the form. He trained with a man in uh, Russia who's considered one of the greatest ballet teachers of all time, because he also trained Nureyev and Makarova. And this guy is a teacher, I think his name is Petrov or something like that was brilliant, right? There's a fascinating essay that I read recently by um, T.S. Eliot, and it's talking about the inheritance of tradition, and that you can't innovate, you can't change, you can't evolve unless you know what came before. So that again, for me, that's the form. That's understanding so brilliantly and so deeply everything that is in existence, and embodying it, and not just knowing it on a knowledge level, but embodying it on a wisdom level that you can then change. Brishnikov came along, and changed what we knew as dance. And when we were creating Trey McIntyre Project down at the Brishnikov Art Center at White Oak Plantation, we wanted to do something similar. We didn't know it. We didn't ambitiously state it that way.
but we knew that we wanted to create a new way of behaving and believing and participating in a dance company. But more than that, we wanted to participate in the world around us. We wanted to participate in our communities. So after four years of building up this vision and brand and culture, it was time for us to launch as a full-time endeavor, which basically meant all the theaters that we've been touring to in the summertime were pretty limited, summer festivals. There's one, you know, Wolf Trap in Washington, D.C., Vail, Aspen, Jacob's Pillow in the Berkshires, some other places, and we were running out of venues to tour to, and, but a lot of theaters who program year-round but not in the summer, like the Harris Theater here in town, they do some summer programming, so we'd love to bring you if you launch. So we made that leap. We had no idea where most of our money was going to be coming from, but we had faith. And we, as I mentioned, had our pick of where to base this company. When launching any business, you look at who's your audience, where's the, again, where's the money going to come from. Trey had been the resident choreographer in Houston for 17 years at that time, so that was a given. We should be in Houston. But what does that mean? Does Houston really need another dance company? Does Houston really benefit from, from Trey's unique vision? Uh, we looked at San Francisco and Washington, D.C. and all these places, and then we chose Boise, Idaho, because it was 2008, and you might recall there was a recession, and we said, why form a dance company? What's the point of this? Why are we doing this? That question of why was really big on our minds. And aside from Trey needing a un his own medium, you know, his dancers that he knew and a culture that we were building, that would support his vision, we said, because Boise needs a world-class arts institution, because we feel we could be of relevance and make an impact in Boise, Idaho, in a way that we likely couldn't in San Francisco. Chicago has over like 80 dance companies, San Francisco has over 250, New York has over 3,000 established dance companies. That might just be a choreographer who assembles two dancers once a year and does a small show, but they're still on record as being a dance company. We wanted to make an impact. We wanted to be of value to our community. The success of Trey McIntyre Project is such, and Betty illuminated a little bit, in time we became the city's first ever economic development cultural ambassador. And then that was followed up by being named a cultural ambassador by the U.S. State Department, sent to Vietnam, China, Philippines, Korea, Dominican Republic, Colombia, to represent the U.S. Because we developed a, a set of behaviors and a way of being that was embraced by the entire culture of Trey McIntyre Project. Meaning, in many dance companies, you have a culture of the artist, how they behave, what they do, how they go about their day. And you have a culture of the staff, who often feel like second-rate citizens, who sort of just are there to support the talent. I'm told that's similar to how the staff feel at the University of Chicago sometimes. <laughs> you also then have the culture of the board of directors, who are usually affluent, you know, connected, people of status in your community who come and, and in, in, in the worst case scenario treat the dancers and the dance company like their little pet you know this is my little thing that I help in the best case scenario which is what we build a Trey McIntyre project they say this is my company this, this is just a part of me I want to be a part of this world not just see myself as some grand benefactor helping make it possible and then you have the, the culture of the public who come and participate and fund and interact with the organization. At TMP, we knew we needed to create one culture, not these four disparate cultures. Everybody speaking the same language and understanding the same why, because the why, I think, is really big. It's easy to know what the what is, like, well, the what? The, the repertoire and the dancers and the information, the knowledge and how and how it happens and how it comes together. And it's easy to get really caught up on those things, too, when you're launching a nonprofit. How are we going to make it happen? What are we going to make happen? But you have to keep asking yourself the why. Because the why is what unifies people. The why is what gets everybody on that same page of what I would call sort of a, a more creative process, a more creative mindset of, okay, why do we do that? And I don't mean why necessarily in the, um, you know, it's not fatalistic, like why do that? I don't want to do that. It's not worth it. <coughs> but how, why is this important and relevant? And we wanted to build a culture that is embracing these four sectors and bringing them together in a way that we could create something greater than the sum of our parts. And Boise, uh, Trey really is an artistic, brilliant man, and many would say a genius. 
his job was to be the, the creator and, and create these ideas, and it was my job to then understand how those ideas were shared and, and, and were integrated into our community and communities. But Trey would create a pre-show video before every performance, and that's becoming a little more de rigueur, like people are doing that more frequently, but in 2008, the first video we did at our first Boise performance, 2,000 people sitting there in the theater, we would do a matinee in the evening, 2,000 at each show, Boise is only 200,000 people. That's 2% of the population showing up on a given Saturday <laughs> to watch a dance company. First thing, curtain comes up and Trey has produced, edited, shot a video that just says, I love Boise. And it's the dancers and staff and board and members of the public, one at a time, a quick montage, naming the thing they love about Boise and then being in that location. Like, I love the Boise Co-op, or I love Graver Hair Salon because they give us free haircuts. <coughs> or I love wildflower cookies because they make sure that we always are well fed. And these are, these are strategic, some of these are strategic decisions. These are the people that when we moved to Boise stepped forward and began, began a relationship with us. Or I love every parking meter in downtown Boise has a free 20 minute button. I think that's the greatest thing ever. You pull up and you hit that 20 minute button. Because most of the time you only need 20 minutes. Or the foothills that line the city and are not being developed because some smart citizens raised money to create a levy to prevent those foothills from being developed so that the pristine beauty of that valley is always there. Or I love Mayor Beater because he bikes to work every day. I love Jim Everett, the CEO of the YMCA, because he is the most gregarious man in the community and you see him everywhere. Or I love the Shakespeare Festival, because it's the epicenter of summer life in Boise. This was our love letter to this community, where we've been living for about, at that point, about six months. It then was the homepage of the city of Boise's website for about a year and a half. How do we as artists be of great social value and relevance? We didn't really know it all at the time, but we had the idea and then we brought it to life we wanted to move to Boise, Idaho because we wanted to make an impact and we wanted to be of value. We wanted to establish that an artist, a dancer, a creative is more than just the product that we put out. So it's more than just the show. It's about this process that we all share together. This process of living. If you ask most people, whatever percentage they give, the majority of almost anybody's day is not the product. It's not when you come home and significant other says, well, how was your day? Usually you list the bullets of everything you got done or kind of what happened, but most of your day is going through life, interacting with the world around you, talking with people, not of anything of significance, just observing your surroundings, observing small moments. I think that when you really open your eyes, the world around you is completely electric. There's so much information. And how we process that information, I think there's a degree of creativity in I just finished reading the latest book by the IDO brothers, Dave and Tom Kelly, and they wrote a book called Creative Confidence, and it's about design thinking. I'm sure some of you have heard about that. Uh, Booth School is now doing a design thinking type course, but it started at Stanford. And it's just really about that process of living life and, and having empathy, seeing the world around you and understanding why it matters, <coughs> who it matters to. So it's not just about getting to the end result or figuring out the answer. I'm coaching some students at Booth right now, and all they want is just to give you the right answer. And it's like, well, let's take a little more time. Like, why do you feel that way? Why does that matter? Why does that answer matter? Is it because you think it's the right answer? Well, right is a pretty arbitrary term. Truth is an arbitrary term. We all have our own truths. We all have our own realities. Life is subjective. How do you take that information and then turn it into your own personal way of experiencing life? So, I was blessed to work with a man, with Alonzo King, who taught me how to hone that creative process within the domain of dance. When we got to Boise, Idaho, we had to realize why does it matter that a dance company lives here? One of our board members from Washington, D.C was sort of angry one day, and she's like, they don't get it in the beginning when we moved to Boise. They don't get it. It's, it's like y'all are the Lakers, and you just moved to Boise. You know, they don't understand the caliber or the reason. 
but you can't just go up to people and be like, we're like the Lakers and we just moved to Boise, so you, you need to support us. Because it wasn't easy. It wasn't like we showed up and we were showered with riches. Boise is not a wealthy community. To this day, only a third of the company's annual budget is provided by Idaho, the entire state. It's still very much a national, international company. A lot of people, and at many board meetings, it was suggested, why don't we leave? Because it's financially not panning out. I mean, how much, we live in a monetary world, right? We live in a world where the bottom line is usually about what we can quantify. This is a quantitative school. We're always looking at the metrics and the data and how we prove something's worth, usually by how it stacks up in, in numbers. I'm not opposed to that, but I think there is a way of experiencing the world that's not quantifiable. And I think the majority of us spend our day and our time experiencing the world in a way that is not quantifiable. I think that the data is important because it backs up your truth and what you're trying to say and how you're saying it. And it gives us a commonality that we can all then understand and work off of. But what if there's other ways of stating value? And many people at this school are doing brilliant studies on that. People are studying wisdom and knowledge and human potential and a thousand other things. I mean, this is a, a hive of activity and brilliance of people looking into these subjects. I think there's something bubbling up in the zeitgeist right now, which is we recognize that we, are, we live in a free market capitalist world. Again, thanks very much in part to this university. <laughs> but we're also realizing that there's limitations. I, mean, I would state, you know, we're running out of physical frontiers. We're running out of natural resources. We're running out of finite things that we know how to measure and look at and expend and, and, and produce. I would argue that the next frontiers, as they always have been, though, are, are the realms of our minds and our souls, and, and where are we headed, and how do we creatively keep evolving when we run out of resources, both physical and metaphorical. But I, I could foresee in the next couple generations an artist or a creative becoming a world leader, someone that has the ability to see the unknown, and to channel it, and to convince others. What does an artist do? They see the unknown, they distill it, and if they're good, they then channel it into an elo eloquent, articulate product that makes people realize something in a way they haven't before. I mean, isn't that we one of our world leaders to keep showing us possibilities and then showing us how to get there? Again, innovation and creativity are such big buzzwords, right? And it's, a little unpalatable after a while, you just kind of keep hearing it, what does it mean? So, when we were making up this session, because we made it up today, I said, yeah, the utility of the creative process, because I, I really hope in my time here at University of Chicago, we can better understand the utility of the creative process. How do we look at it? How do we measure it? How do we state it in an unequivocal way that everyone can agree that it has value? So, the decision-making process in our world is very much often happening in the hands of a small committee of people, right? It's usually people sitting around a table in a boardroom making massive decisions. And that's okay, because we live in a somewhat hierarchical system, and we have elected officials, or we have people that we trust to make these decisions on our behalf. But it's also a lot of people sitting in a corporate boardroom, ExxonMobil, making massive decisions that are going to affect billions of people. At that table, I surmise, are, are, you know, are people proficient in a financial process. <laughs> They're understanding the money and where it's going, why it matters. And there's people in that room who understand a legal process, a political process, an analytical process. People understanding economics and engineering and all sorts of other things. Do we really have someone, though, in that room who primarily identifies as having a creative process? Someone who's seen you know, the Tenth Man philosophy. Everybody understands it one way, but maybe we need someone in the room who understands it in a way that's slightly different. Who's seeing the world in a way that we don't yet understand, and not just, again, maximizing the form. And usually, in many senses, that means maximizing profit. But understanding the, the disparate, disparate pieces of information and correlating them and bringing them together. So I'm working on a project here in Chicago with a woman where we're looking at just that. Maybe 
we begin placing some name brand artists who not only have mastered their form. You know, we're not talking to Yo-Yo Ma, but I'll just use Yo-Yo Ma as an example. He's, he's a celloist, right? But he's not. He's a lot more than that. He's a brilliant artist, and many of you maybe know he's highly involved in social activism. He's working on education, arts education at the highest levels. He's highly involved in the Aspen Institute. He's an artistic advisor to the CSO here in town. He's a brilliant man. He also practices six to seven hours every day. He's not letting up on his form. He's still practicing every day and mastering it. But if you talk to him, that's his creative process too. That's his meditation. That's how he makes sense of the world. That's how he's figuring things out. What if we placed Yo-Yo Ma on the Exxon Mobile board? What does that mean? It's definitely a symbolism. Not an artist deserves to be at that level. How many artists are on the board of trustees or board of regents of the University of Chicago? How many artists are sitting on the boards of other governmental and social and corporate enterprises? I've shared this idea a couple times with some people, and some people think it's a good idea, some people think it's you know, sort of blasphemous. Well, what, what would Yo-Yo Ma lend to ExxonMobil? He has no idea about that world. And I say, how many businessmen know anything about dance if they sit on dance boards? <laughs> you know, like, I think there's a, uh, a relevance and a value to this very loose and broad thing I'm currently saying as the creative process. And every time I get an opportunity to talk to people like yourself, it's, it's hard to put it into words. And I'm giving you a lot of different examples of what I think it is and how it is and how it's evolving and what, what it might be and the potentialities of it. I do believe, though, that I hope that some of the work I get to do while I'm here, but definitely the work that the Astor Gates is doing here at the university and, and in Chicago and many other brilliant, brilliant minds around the world, there's something bubbling up in the zeitgeist. People are all starting to understand. Artists can be social activists. They can be citizens. What does that mean? It means you show up and you participate in your community. You understand what's, what's working, what's not working, and then you creatively problem solve. Life hacks, constantly figuring out how this world can be a little bit better. I was sitting yesterday at a booth in one of the classrooms, and because of the way the lighting was set up, the slides were on, and the speaker was in darkness the entire time, and I just thought, she needs some front lights. Like, she just <laughs> needs some good old-fashioned stage lighting, because you couldn't even see her. Little tiny things, tiny... Tiny solutions, and those lead to big solutions. Again, you know, I mentioned the Astor Gates, and if you don't know his work, look it up. He's doing a lot around how we're developing the south side of Chicago, the area around the university, but more importantly, how we're just evolving the idea of what an artist is and can be, relevance and validity. So this creative process, I believe, intrinsically, and through my own empirical experiences, I know it has great value, because it's benefited me. I learned how to be an executive director because I channeled the creative process I learned as a dancer. I have no idea why I'm here at this university right now. But I have to just keep trusting, and I have to keep believing, and I have to also be extremely disciplined. So I'm here for a two-year period. I've been asked to do nothing, which is brilliant and fantastic, and it's such a gift. There's no... Requirements. I don't have to write a thesis paper. I don't have to... I mean, yes, there's minor expectations. I, I interact with Booth, and I interact with UChicago Arts. And then I get to choose to interact with Harris, and Humanities, and Law School, and whoever else I choose. For me, I'm, I, part of my creative process is I'm throwing the net wide, and then I just, I'm finding things that make sense. And sometimes I don't know why they make sense. But then as I keep corralling and dovetailing them, I realize, I'm starting to realize what that feeling is, or what's guiding me. And it's people that, again, see the world for what we all agree it is, but then they see what more it could be. So that's just optimism, right? Or that's just, you know, it's a, lo it's a lot of things. We can't just say that's a creative person or a creative process. But I think there is a, a, a space that we can hold and collectively state but that's valuable, that way of seeing the world, that way of believing in the evolution of what we can be and what we can do. And I would, at this point, maybe I'll disagree with myself next week, argue that that is a creative mindset. And we need to better state that it has purpose. Because at this moment, we can't prove it with numbers. We can't back it up in a quantitative way. And I mean, 
cultural policy center is trying their darndest to do just that. How do we state the value of culture and art? And, and they're doing great work, and a lot of people are doing great work in stating the, what I would say is the product, you know, the show, the film, the piece of architecture, because it's, it's, it's concrete and it's certain. But what is this realm of the process? And does it have utility? So I'll ask you that question. Because I, I do about two to three of these sorts of talks a week, and I truthfully forget what I even just said in the past hour. I'm not even sure I hit all the points I was hoping to make today, but it's really a dialogue of, do you feel there is such a thing? Do you recognize it in yourself? And I, I, do, I am going to ask this question of you, and we can spend the rest of our time just chatting and talking about this, and I'll take some questions as well. But... As I, uh, as I sit with students daily, because I make space every day to sit with students, I have an open calendar, whoever emails me, I'll set up time, and college, uh, students from the college, from Harris, from Law, from Booth, from the med school have all been coming and meeting with me. And they all usually come in with a very uh, concrete plan, like they want to tell me what they're doing next. You know, so what I have figured out, I'm majoring in this, I you know, intend to go to grad school, or I intend to get a job, or I'm a second year MBA, and I already have my job lined up, and, and then that's usually how it almost always goes. And then I say, okay, so why are you meeting with me? Like, what are you, what, what are you looking for? What are you asking? And they say, well, we, I read about your position, or I heard you talk, and you're talking about this space of the unknown, and I just feel like there's a lot of things I don't know, and how do I embrace that, and am I making the right choice? And 45 minutes later, usually, there's some tears, and usually, <laughs> usually I realize I'm becoming like some form of a guidance counselor. <laughs> because I say, well, why? Do you, why? What are all the shoulds? So you should go do this job, right? Why? Well, I got my MBA. I need to go work for McKinsey. It makes a lot of money. It's considered the you know the best consulting firm in the world. They've offered me a job. And, what are all the coulds? Well, you can go to McKinsey, you have the skill, you have the training, you have the resume. Or, you know, um, I was meeting with a student from the college who's uh, majoring in gender studies and within Southeast Asia, and she's a first-generation Chinese-American, so she wants to go live in <coughs> Hong Kong and then live on the mainland and work on, you know, her, her language skills and be with family. And, I mean, that all sounds great. So you should do that. Why? Well, my parents want me to. And it's what I majored in. And you could go do that. Why? Because you have the language skills and there's a reasoning for it. But the hardest question I think to ask yourself is, what do you really want? What do you really want? And at many points in your life, you won't be able to answer that question. At many points in your life, you're locked into a path that you chose or someone chose for you. And you just got to kind of see it out, right? You got to finish it. But what do you really want? And there's moments that, you, that come up, and during, especially during transition moments, or as I call them, the space in between moments, where this whole path is coming to an end and you have a whole new path, but what do you really want? And that's the time, I think, where you need to step back and, ex and see the world and see all the information that's coming in and take all the form and all the knowledge and all the history and all of your inheritance and all the crap and good stuff from your parents and family and all the data you have debt, you have, you bring in X amount of money, just all the data. I'll call that the form. And then you have to really discover what you want. Which is not just feelings, but the feeling. How do you want to be? How do you want to wake up? How do you want to feel as you go through your day? How do you want to make allowance for that to change? They teach students really well at this school to make a decision, back it up, go forward, support it. You know, follow this trajectory. I think that's great because now it makes space because I think we as a culture are moving more and more towards that way of being. And then once we sort of continue mastering that form is when I think you can start to then open yourself up to this idea of who am I creatively? And how do I want to experience that? How do I want to express that in the world? A lot of the students say, well, I feel like I'm going to go do this job at McKinsey and get success, and then I can be creative. Then I can have choice. I have enough millions in the bank that I can go do what I want. I think that's a valid path. It's not my path. 
is I feel like to live the life I want, I have to keep having one foot in what I know, and then I have just to keep stepping out over that precipice. Because otherwise I feel like all I'm doing is living in the shoulds and the coulds, you know, knowing what I can get paid for, knowing what I can do, but what's my calling, right? You know, a job is what you get paid for, a career is what, you know, you can advance through and gain lifelong support. But then a calling is who you want to be. So these are a lot of different ideas, and I'm trying to succinctly tie them up and say, oh, it's all about a creative process, which I don't even know if that's fully true, but I think there's a utility in living in a way in which you know your personal truths, and then I think there's a, a beauty in having that balance of form and feeling, where you're then able to back them up with data, knowledge, information. So I'm not poo pooing the form. In fact, it has to be equal. Too much feeling, and you get the cliched, you know, artist, hippy dippy, can't pay their rent, not making, you know, not getting through life. I think the point of life is to better know yourself, to better know your unknown parts, as Jung would say, your shadow side, to keep embracing the parts of you that aren't what you put on your resume. So, yeah, we'd love to, love to have this dialogue now with you. You can also ask questions. I loosely skipped over a lot of parts of my story, and you can ask anything you like, but... Um, yeah. I'm curious about, in your experience, the difference, if there is one, between the creative process for an individual and the creative process for a group. And you kind of talked about both in the way that you know, we could put Yo-Yo Ma on the Exxon Mobile board, and, he could be sort of a um, um, you know, trickster or poke holes or bring up little questions and play that role. But what about what about pulling more creativity from any, everybody else? And how do you? It seems like very often you can bring together ten creative people and they're great at the creative process individually, but you put them all around the table together and you get sort of product out of it, right? So what is your experience with that been? Because it seems like dancers in particular have to be really good at, at working in that sort of group creative atmosphere. Yeah, I, I sometimes I feel like the most um, people who are the least open to these ideas are creatives. Because <laughs> they have maybe already de developed their own creative process and they don't want to collectively come together and, and share one vision. I think that we need them putting someone like Yo-Yo Ma on a board is to add that element to the other processes. Mm -hmm. It's not to say that his is, again, better than, it's equal to. And I think that we don't recognize that, and we don't treat it as such. So the idea, that's just the first step in like what I think needs to happen. We don't have role models right now of creatives that are excelling as citizens or as world leaders, necessarily people that will choose to primarily identify as a creative. We all like to say, oh, Rahm Emanuel was a ballet dancer once upon a time. And it's kind of like a joke almost, but it's like, that should be stated pretty proudly, I think. But it's, it's not cool to be a dancer. It's considered effeminate if you're a man. It's considered the epitome of beauty and elegance if you're a woman. But it's pretty dirty and sweaty most of the time. Like, it's not, it's not like it's a really cute <coughs> thing. So... Some of it's language, and I think you can draw interesting information from, you know, sort of other um, equal rights movements that have happened through time. At first, you have to state the excellence of this thing to gain validity, but the goal is actually for it to be very commonplace. So Harry Davis, who's the man who brought me to be a part of the Booth School, he recognizes, and I very much recognize, I'm a foreign object right now. It's a novelty. It's a new thing. And some people I meet with, especially economists, are like, what are you doing? <laughs> oh, you can't state it for me in two sentences and show me your strategy to back it up? Well, then I'm not going to, I don't really care what you're doing. But slowly, one at a time, I'm having interesting conversations with economists where they're like, yeah, I get it. Like, I spend most of my day not knowing how to figure something out. And then how do I better fine tune that process? Yo Yo Ma, you know, again, as a pure example, we need role models to show that there is worth and validity. Because the ultimate goal is that everybody is practicing a creative process. Just like everybody's asked to practice at some point in their life, 
an analytical or a mathematical process. I mean, we learn all these other skills. And I'm not talking about learning in arts education necessarily, like learning how to play a cello, but I think there's a process separate from just the practicing of a form. So your question about individuals versus organizations, I think that if we all begin to develop this other muscle, we can collectively have more of a common language and include that as part of our conversation as we're evolving our organizations, our nations, whatnot. Because uh, time and again, when it comes down to bottom line, it's easy to throw out the creative aspect or the arts or because it's not considered essential. It is essential. It's our identity. It's our culture. It's who we are. It's how we express ourselves. If you look at most ancient civilizations, we judge them by their arts, culture, and, and their wars. I mean, you know, it's like, but yeah, we still don't give it credence at this time. So develop as individuals, but we need role models to show us how to do it, and that it's social, socially valid. You know, how many parents dissuade their children from going into cre creative careers because there's not stability. There can be stability. Right now there's not because we don't have social validity. We can create a lot more stability. You can be an artist and get paid $3 million a year to sit on the Exxon Mobil board. You know they pay you to sit on corporate boards? Like that was mind blowing for me when I learned that a couple of years ago. Because to me, being on a board is giving of yourself. Giving, giving. being of service. Yes? Um, first, a word of warning, since you're at the University of Chicago, you're assimilating a little, you're getting elbow patches, so you're getting oh my God. sort of. <laughs> <laughs> so you might want to watch out. Um, secondly, I, I'm going to get a little more tactical. Um, as an arts administrator, I've worked at several museums, the Joffrey and, and the Symphony, and I, can you go back to sort of breaking down those walls, because I've never been in an organization that's done it it's sort of very well. And it, it is sort of the board versus the staff versus the sort of creative staff. I don't have a lot of necessarily concrete answers, and we can talk when there's not a camera on me later about <laughs> more specifics. But um, we were you know, we were blessed in the beginning of TMP where we got to build it up with that. It's much harder to go in and create institutional behavioral shifts once they've been established. And I've done some consulting for organizations we can talk about later where I've tried to go in and, and evaluate that. So I have some information about what I think works and what doesn't work. But the biggest thing is, it's a simple exercise of asking that why question. And when I've gone into organizations and asked that why question, you get very different answers. What I know was the truth that TMP, for good or for bad, was that we all believed in the same vision and process, which was simple, simpler, because it was one man's vision, but it wasn't. It was one, initially one man's vision that we all collectively built upon. And the ultimate goal, I felt, as, a, as my job, in my job as executive director, was to keep reinforcing what I called a sense of ownership. That everybody felt like, this is my company, not, oh, that's Trey's company. And that's what happens in a lot of institutional arts organizations. They see it as someone else's job or someone else's responsibility. And that's also, again, what happens in a lot of siloed corporations and other institutions. But they don't have a sense of collective responsibility and collective appreciation. So little things that we would do at Trey McIntyre Project, we would have a weekly staff meeting, but it was all dancers and all staff, and as many board members as could be there. Because again, board came from 10 different states, so most of them didn't even live in Idaho. But we would do simple things, and I, I tried to implement simple pro processes, processes where um, I would witness this time and again, and maybe it was because I was a full-time dancer and a full-time executive director. I was constantly <coughs> back and forth in those worlds. So I kept seeing little behaviors that I felt weren't really supporting the whole. And as simple as, a dancer comes you know, into the, like, the break room, and they're sweating, and they're panting because they just came out of rehearsal. And one of the staff members is obviously somewhat intimidated by them because it's like, you know, they're physically beautiful, and they're sweating, and, they're, and the staff member is like, oh, and they'd always make comments like, Oh, you're so in shape and stuff, and but they they felt bad about their own body. So it's as simple as you're not really understanding each other's processes. You're not appreciating each other. So when the dancer came out, the staff member usually be like, "Oh, how's it going?" They'd be like, "It's good, it's good." And they'd be like, "Oh, so, you know, was it hard? You know, like how it was a good rehearsal?" Like, yeah. And that was the end of the conversation. You're know, like, "No, ask them what did you just rehearse? What's Trey working on? What was the music?" 
how did that unfold? And, and training the dancers to say, yeah, Trey was working on a solo for me, and he was trying it to this song by you know, the Beatles, but then he scratched that. Like, give more information, make it more tangible, even with our own organization, because this person that you're talking to is our grant writer, and she needs those details and that, that contextual knowledge, because ultimately we all need to have a sense of ownership over what this is. So once, you know, anytime the staff was allowed to go in and watch rehearsals, but people wouldn't, you know? So then I made it mandatory once a week. Everybody goes and watches rehearsal. Plan ahead. Don't schedule any meetings. They needed that permission to do it in a mandatory fashion so that they would then do it on their own. But it was about, so, and, and vice versa, when the um, dancer would say, hey, you know, buddy, what are you up to today? And they're like, oh, just, you know, meetings, meetings working. <laughs> They'd be like, oh, okay. See you later, you know, like, <laughs> it's like, no, right now I'm emailing the Harris Theater in Chicago because we negotiated eight rooms per night, but we need ten, and our contract states eight, but we really want to make sure that everybody has a single room on this tour because it's a three-month tour, and we feel that that's going to be better for everybody's mindset, and so I'm debating with them. We're probably going to have to give up two hours of crew time. Like, give those details. And so then we began to make it... Um, Every dancer had an administrative job. At the start of every year, we'd sit with them and think through what their skill set was and what a need was in the company. Again, touring to 30, 40 cities a year, one dancer's whole job was to manage luggage. Both the physical labor aspect of it, like pulling each one off of the conveyor belt and making sure we had all the bags. But when you're traveling in a caravan of 15 people, you've got 30 bags, all the sets, all the costumes, because again, this is a shoestring budget company, we didn't have semis, we weren't shipping stuff. And it also meant if we're flying United, who has status? Who can check three bags? Who doesn't? Can't check any bags? So you need to think out ahead of time, who's checking three bags and they can check overweight bags, this bag's going to weigh 70 pounds, like thinking through as much as possible. It's creating a shared sense of ownership. So the, the dancers, as I saw in other companies I worked at, show up and think their job is solely to be on stage and in the studio. And then they start to get into that, the talent. I don't buy into that. Like, I think that's crap. Because if you can't appreciate the staff member that's going to bat for you to make sure that you have a single room, or the fund, the development officer who's making sure that you get a pay raise this year, you know, like, that's the breakdown. And people start to get more entitled. They start to feel underappreciated. And as happens, staff members often feel like, well, I spend all this work and, I, and I'm working so hard and the talent comes in and they're so disrespectful. You, know, you see that a lot. And then again, the board are affluent people who don't really have enough contextual knowledge. So once a year at the board meeting, um, each board member, each dancer, and each staff member would just tell a story about one thing they appreciate about the company. As detailed as possible. A my, minor thing. Because when people talk in maxims and talk broadly, like me talking to you today, I'm sure most of the broad stuff I said didn't really sink in and it was a little too nebulous and hard, but then when I start to give some more concrete pieces of something, I saw most of you write that down, you know, and that was my own, I need to do that better and sooner and quicker, but it was the same thing within an organization, like, be a human, <laughs> interact, contextualize what it is you do, <coughs> because that leads to a greater sense of ownership and it creates appreciation, and then it, I saw it greatly prevent the things that end up dragging almost every organization down. The infighting, the silos between departments, the lack of um, understanding of what's happening you know, across the board, lack of communication. I'm not saying it was foolproof. A little more time, another yes. I have a question. What's First, your name? I'm Danielle. Danielle. I'm not at UFC. I'm a painter and I have a company called Amuse. And we do arts experiences, interactive. I'm, I, so I'd love to meet you after this. Thank you sure. so much for your time. But I'm curious. Um, I know the Aster. I had the chance to be with Yo-Yo Ma at different events at the CSO. I've heard about a project that Bjork is doing iPads and public education. I don't know anything about it. It's good. I was. I wanted to. I mean, I'd love to talk more. I wanted to ask who are some artists that you're aware of. It sounds like you've been doing a lot of reading and work in the field. Um, who are doing interesting work? Where I mean, you talk about Yo-Yo Ma practicing seven hours, six or seven hours a day, and then also 
of another part of his practice that's some other social engagement. So, um, so I guess it's kind of a two-sided question. One question is, I'm curious about examples of artists who you admire, you're watching, who do their own creative process, and you know, whether it's a social engagement or political engagement, or whether it's engagement with corporations or schools. I mean, there's a lot of different ways to engage. And I guess the same question, the flip side, is um, whether there are any particular cities or communities or even corporations or educational systems that are open to uh, looking at artists' creative processes or sort of more interested in the creative process. So either way, that makes sense to answer the question. I just start with the last question. Um, it's all happening right now. And I see a lot of cities sort of becoming, like opening up to this idea. So I've proposed an idea to two cities now that kind of in talks about me coming on board and helping, so I can't really say sure. too much about it but until the contract's signed. But uh, cities are going through massive reinvention, you know, and how do, I'll tell you one example that I'm not involved in. Detroit is a city in bankruptcy, right? It's, it has failed as a city. And they've created this future cities plan, which has a lot of stakeholders, there's a lot of wealth in Detroit, individual corporate foundation wealth, but not civic wealth. And so they created this whole Future Cities plan, and artists, um, I was being told this uh, by a friend just a couple days ago, so I'm repeating what he said to me, because he's probably gonna watch this video later, I need to make sure I say it correctly. He um, was saying that many artists felt, well, we, we, were not, we haven't been included in this plan, but the flip side and the argument that many are making in, my friend is making is you could be involved in every aspect of this plan. Sewage, sanitation, transportation, energy. What happens if we place a creative mind in every level of civic planning, especially as you're going through this ground up reinvention? What happens if the way you look at healthcare is driven mostly by dancers and movement as a means to solving many of our issues and you build like a real medical wellness platform based off of incorporation of these brilliant movement artists. What happens if you, I mean, who better knows how to move bodies around than a choreographer? Why would they not be involved in light rail transit planning? You know what I'm saying? And many people can say, well, they don't know anything about engineering. or uh, It's like, sure, but they have another intuitive skill set maybe that's a value. So uh, Detroit, I think, could be an example of a city that's going to, could, at this moment, look at how do we integrate? How do we compensate them? Like, it's maybe a staff job. Does that mean that artist has to give up their other practice, or is this an addition to, or are they one and the same? You know, for years, Kohler has had an artist in residence who sits there in the middle of the factory and makes art. Um, I'm working on a project in Milwaukee that is about movement, wellness, education, and art. So it's the Milwaukee Ballet, the Medical College of Wisconsin, which is the medical school, and the University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee, creating a new $45 million project together. It's a building, but it's also collective programs, which are using movement as a catalyst to greater social well-being and health and medical research. And they're gonna have you know a treatment, PT treatment facility, and I'm arguing really hard that it should be right in the middle of all the dance studios. So people getting treatment are constantly looking at the studios, and this is what I'm arguing for. I'm not sure it's gonna happen. Sorry. You know, every dancer has to spend one hour of their day participating in one of the collaborative projects or programs. And maybe that's that might mean they have one hour less a day to rehearse, which of course scares the ballet company. But maybe they do rounds with the med students, and that dancer is observing, and they don't speak the language. But maybe they can say, oh, you know, we're talking to this person who ruptured their Achilles, and the dancer can be like, I ruptured my Achilles. And here is my path to recovery. It wasn't just about do the exercise 20 times. It's like, how do you heal? Well, first, in order to heal, you have to envision what you want your body to be like. And dancers are, in many ways, an epitome of good health and physicality. But they also, again, if they're, some of them, all of them have a creative process and how did you because it's not the physical uh, healing it's the mental emotional psychological like how are you getting over those things and, and getting back to recovery so I think there's a lot of examples we can talk more um, but I think it's also right now this is a moment of reinvention 
And I think if, if artists and creatives, and again, a creative can be a creative surgeon. Because there's a creative surgeon who's working on this project in Milwaukee, and he's great. Like, he's thinking of these ideas. So it's not just the domain of the creative class. This is a time where I think you can invent a new way of being. And not all of them will work. And in fact, many of them will fail. But out of that failure, I think we'll find new pathways. So for past time. I think we should stop. Yeah. But thank you so much. But thank you all. I'll hang out for a little bit.